Hello everyone and welcome to the LMN Speaker Series. Here at LMN we're dedicated to helping landscape professionals build better businesses through our industry leading software and education. Our speaker series is designed to bring you best practices from the experts. If you're in snow, chances are you're familiar with our speaker. Today we're pleased to have Kevin Gilbride with us. Kevin is the executive director of the ASCA and he's been doing an incredible job advocating for snow and ice contractors across North America. Kevin started in the snow industry in 1996 and has since held various management roles with GIE Media, leading the successful launch of Snow Magazine and various other industry magazines. Kevin's passionate about the issues facing snow and ice contractors and is traveling the US to push legislation that protects them. He'll be speaking today about the Snow Removal Liability Limitations Act, its status and the positive impact it's having. Plus, you'll learn best practices for reducing liability in your business. We've saved some time for questions at the end. Please type your questions in the chat window, which can be found in the bottom right corner of your screen. If we can't get to your question, we'll be sure to have Kevin reach out with an answer after the webinar. Welcome, Kevin. I'll now turn it over to you for reducing liability, the laws and best practices that will keep snow contractors in business. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, thank you and the, the, all the folks at LMN for having me on today. Uh, I'm excited to speak to your audience, uh, which is generally the same as mine. Um, I know that uh, we've had deep conversations about uh, the issues at hand and some of the solutions that are out there. Uh, I want to take a minute to just give a little bit of uh, background here. For those that aren't familiar with, uh, with me or with uh, the ASCA, so uh, you had indicated that uh, I've spent uh, most of my career here with GIE Media, which is true, and the ASCA is joined uh, or owned by GIE Media. Um, I'm the executive director of the Accredited Snow Contractors Association. Uh, we launched the association back in 2012 in response to a conference that we had had the year before under the uh, Snow Magazine heading. And so we had, uh, I don't know, 63, I think the number was, of the top 100 contractors in the snow and ice management business uh, here in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm located for a day and a half seminar. And we ended the seminar talking about issues that were facing their businesses. And as I stood up on stage with uh, Troy Clogg uh, and Mike Zawacki, the editor of uh, the magazine, listening to um, this open forum discussion of the things that were going on in the snow industry, you know, the biggest thing that was thrown out there uh, and repeatedly was insurance and insurance and insurance. And as I sat there listening to this, you know, I thought to myself, man, here they go again, you know, complaining about insurance rates. And, um, you know, I thought, you know, it's it's the same cycle. Um, you know, that's that's the, the biggest issue. But they touched on other things like hold harmless agreements and indemnification clauses and all that. And so I made a commitment that day to, to look into it on behalf of the industry. And so um, I, I started looking into it by meeting with insurance carriers and meeting with um, insurance agents, anybody I could really find in that industry that, that kind of knew about it and um, basically got laughed out of almost every room. And so as I dug deeper, that led me to talking with attorneys and um, that led me to talking with legislatures. And what I really found was insurance wasn't the issue. Insurance was a symptom of the issue. And so the issue was actually uh, much deeper than that. And the issue was the insurance carriers didn't know this industry very well, uh, didn't know how to write insurance for this industry or what to look for, number one. Number two, um, and quite frankly, the snow and ice management industry didn't do a whole lot to represent itself well to the outside world. So who's the outside world? Well, it's the insurance companies and it's the legislative bodies and it's the um, property owners, property managers, your customers. And so, you know, how did you differentiate um, yourselves from one another? And everybody had a little different way of doing it, but there was no one real way to identify uh, a quality uh, snow and ice management company from somebody that had, you know, a 1970 pickup truck and a, and a plow. And so when I started looking into that, I started looking at this saying, wow, there's a whole lot more to this than just the insurance issue. Um, and so we founded the ASCA on the four pillars of trying to fix this problem. And once again, we don't 
say it's insurance because it's really risk management. It is really the way that you handle yourself as a business. It's the practices that you employ. But there was no consistency across the board. And certainly when insurance company got a claim, they couldn't tell if you had good practices to defend yourself or not. Um, and so what do they do? They settle. And so um, that just compounded the problem. So when we founded ASCA, the first thing that we did um, was establish the four pillars. And the first pillar was written industry standards. And I'll talk about that today and how those can help you manage risk in your business. Um, and then we, you know, we got the standards. So let's talk about, you know, educating folks on the standards. And so that's education. Um, when I'm talking with the insurance companies that are, you know, that are losing millions of dollars uh, in the snow and ice management industry, great. So you're going to educate people. Well, we want to know that they've actually implemented these practices in their businesses. And so that's the verification stage. And then finally, positive legis legislative change. And I'll walk through each one of these steps and talk about you know, risk and risk management throughout. But let's look at this and uh, let's be realistic here and ask the questions. You know, do property managers really care? So I mean, is that quality work? You know, when you flip through and look at what we've got there, um, that is actually December 22nd in 2014 when I took this picture. Um, not hiding what kind of a building it is. So that's 2 p.m. Snow ceased at 8 a.m. So when you look at that, does the property owner care or did the contractor just do a bad job? Or did they hire a contractor that couldn't do the job because they don't care. And so, you know, they're supposed to have somebody on there that's doing the job according to the scope of work. Obviously, you're looking at this. Anytime you see blue, you know that's handicapped. So 8 p.m. at night, I mean, the snow, snow stopped at, you know, 8 in the morning. So if you look real closely there, they're going to need some new landscaping in the spring. And that's where they're going to keep their uh, extra carts. So... <laughs> You guys and, and gals out there know what a good job is and what it's not a good job. And, and you recognize that the property owners and managers can be part of the problem. And so let's start at the very beginning, um, you know, and there's not a lot of differentiating, you know, between snow and ice management companies, um, but whose fault is that? And so let's take a look at the major issue. And this is dealt with at a variety of levels with ASCA, but it starts with the indemnification clause in your contract. If you are not looking and reading at the indemnification clause in your contract before signing it, you, you could virtually put yourself out of business. The hold harmless agreement is part of that cause clause. So what is the indemnification clause? For those of you who don't know, it's the, it's the clause that determines who, who is going to hold liability. And then the hold harmless clause is the one who de determines who is going to defend you. And so when you look at what this looks like, um, you know, the indemnification clause, and I'm not going to dive deep into this aspect of it because I'm not an attorney, but if your indemnification clause reads something to the effect of that the Snow and Ice Management Company will be responsible for any and all accidents, incidences, and injuries on the property as it relates to snow and ice, it's probably not very helpful for you. If the scope of work with a clause like that in the contract reads, that you will not commence plowing until there's two inches on the ground and the property owner will tell you when to salt. You have just signed a contract because of the indemnification clause and the hold harmless agreement that makes you liable if there's one inch on the ground and you're not supposed to do the job. Okay, we've got a great course online on ASCA and Josh, and with uh, Josh Ferguson, who spends a whole 45, 50 minutes talking about good contract language and bad contract language. And, you know, the long and short of it is this is. The, the root of the problems in this industry is the indemnification clauses that are in the contracts. And we recognize that. We've got a solution for it. It's a long-term solution and it takes some time. Um, but we've got things you can do today until we get to the more permanent solution, which is the legislative fix. And I will talk about that later on. Um, the whole harmless agreement is great because what that does is it determines that you've now signed a contract where you're responsible for everything. You're not allowed to plow till there's two inches on the ground. And so you're not allowed to do the job. But since you signed the hold harmless agreement, because you're going to hold the property owner harmless, you now have to, your insurance company, 
has to hire an attorney to defend you in a lawsuit that or a claim in which you weren't even supposed to do the work. And since you had signed the whole harmless agreement, they have to hire a different attorney for conflict of interest reasons in order to, to defend your customer, your property owner. So you're told not to do the work and your insurance company has all the liability on them. This is why the insurance companies are getting out of the industry. Okay, so it's actually four years ago uh, now the insurance carriers broke out what was going on in the snow industry. As you know, probably eight, 10 years ago, most of your policies were part of your landscape policy. And so snow was buried somewhere in there. For those of you in the excavating or power sweeping field, it's the same thing. It was just an extra deal there. And the insurance carriers were looking at this going, wow, we used to be so profitable in our landscape, in our landscape policies, and we're really losing money here. And so um, they were losing profit. They weren't completely unprofitable. So they broke out snow to take a look at what these policies looked like with just snow alone and just landscape alone, okay? What they found was that snow and ice management companies are paying $500 million annually in premium for your general liability um, insurance for snow. And they were paying out a billion dollars annually in claims. So the math isn't too hard there. If you're running a million dollar snow business, and you have $2 million in expenses, you're out of the snow business pretty quickly. The insurance companies got out of the business because it's not a profitable business for them. That's really what they're looking at. The ones that are still in are high premium snow and ice management uh, or uh, uh, insurers. Um, so let's go to the stats and let's look at what's going on out there so that you understand what they're looking at from an insurance perspective. There are 30,000 plus slip and fall claims annually in the United States and Canada that are filed against snow and ice management companies and property owners and management companies. 35% of them are outright dismissed. Okay, that means the snow and ice management company was able to get the insurance company to fight for them and get rid of the claim. Of the 65% that are left, 72% of them are lost or settled for $20,000 or less. They're nuisance suits intending a quick payout. We know that, you know that, um, it's a pain in the neck. Um, you know, it's, we'll talk about, you know, frivolous lawsuits and all that, but you know, the way the laws read today, you can, fi you can file a lawsuit against anybody for anything with, with no claims. And that's part of the problem um, or with no proof. So, the most important fact, and this is really where you have to look at it from a risk management standpoint, is of the claims that are lost or settled, most of the time, more than 50% of the time, the reason that they're lost or settled is due to lack of documentation. It's why the insurance company's lawyers recommend settling, because you can't prove what you did on ABC property at 2.12 in the morning on January 14th, 2018. Most of the statute of limitations are two years. When do they file the lawsuit? Two days before they hit the two years. Why do they do that? Because they're hoping that you don't maintain your documentation and you can't remember what was going on on that property. Now, as you know, most of you are servicing multiple properties. So can you remember what crew was on this property at this point? Well, some of you can. You guys are all LMN users, and some of the stuff I'm talking about, it will benefit you because you are an LMN user. Um, they gather a lot of the data that goes along with the industry standards. So um, I'll talk about that here momentarily. Um, but think about that from that standpoint, why utilizing an LMN system is so good, because it tracks the data for you that you need, okay? And this is stuff that you will now have on record because it's stored. There's a couple of pictures from across the country, and we all know it's a little bit ridiculous, but these, I mean, this is the advertising for this plaintiff's attorney's firm. So snow and ice fall down, they got $463,000 for. Now, if you look real closely in the snow on the lower right-hand corner, they're lawyers, so they have to have a disclaimer, right? And that reads, prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. So um, that picture was taken in New York, if anybody's curious. Um, 
And here's what the ultimate result is. This is the snow insurance page for a insurance agent out of Jersey. We don't sell snow insurance anymore. That's how bad it's gotten in some cases. Okay, that's a little bit older, but that's ultimately shows the picture. If you can't get insurance, what do you do? So that's some of the reality here is the insurance companies don't want to insure the industry. The industry has to do what it needs to do to get better, so to speak. Um, and we need to work together to try and get solutions legislatively, which we are doing. So let's dive in here now to the first one. Let's talk about the industry standards. <clears throat> what are the standards? So there's an organization out there called the American, American National Standards Institute. They are the top standards development organization in the United States. They're a nonprofit organization. And their job simply is to maintain standards development organizations and standards for different industries. There are thousands of standards for different industries that uh, are registered and accredited by ANSI. Um, <clears throat> the reason that we went with ANSI is because the first place a plaintiff's attorney or a defense attorney goes when they get a suit, especially like a slip and fall claim, is they go to ANSI and they go to see if there's a standard for the industry. And if you follow that standard, you're going to have a much better argument in depositions than in a courtroom um, when you're trying to defend yourself in a claim. So the standards were developed by peers of your own, uh, directors of operations and owners of what I would consider top snow and ice management companies. Uh, a better way to put it is best practices. Um, that's what they really are. They're the best practices for snow and ice management companies across the country. We spent six months developing the first version of this. Uh, we actually met on conference call every Monday morning from 10 to 11 a.m. Then we talked about the different things that would be standard in this business and things that you need to do in your business. So um, I always say that it's a living, breathing document. Uh, it been, so what does that mean? It's going to change over time. We actually just went through a five-year renewal of the standard. Um, and uh, so we updated uh, anything that needed to be updated in the standard. There was no major changes this time around, uh, which is good because that means we were doing a pretty good job with the standard. Um, but really, the credibility comes from ANSI. And I think that is important to understand um, that having the ANSI name behind it makes it makes it credible and it gives you folks as contractors practices processes and procedures to follow and employ in your business to make a better business and in order to have a more risk averse business so um canadian standards association for anybody that might be from canada uh, we have spoken with them uh, about potentially making this standard uh, canadian national standard as well um, they wanted $80,000 to do that. We developed this standard for about seven. Um, so our Canadian members and I have uh, had conversations. We're continuing to try and talk with the CSA. However, it's important to note that in Canada, in lieu of a Canadian national standard, the court system recognizes the American national standard or the ANSI standards as acceptable. So the ANSI standard is recognized in the Canadian court system. So everything we talk about here today is good for US and Canadian snow and ice management companies. So, so what's in the standards? What, are, what am I talking about here? <laughs> um, first four or five sections, or first four sections are really kind of ANSI stuff that we had to put in. Um, we had to become an ANSI uh, standards development organization, and we did that five years ago, six years ago now, I guess. And then we went and developed the standard. And so the first, what I would call section that has meat to it, is um, the education and training, okay? And then we go through um, what education and training you should provide to your employees and to your service providers. Uh, then we get into pre-season inspection reports. Um, you need to have a pre-season site inspection report for every single property. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what those are, but it's essentially a blueprint of the property or a picture of the property, and it's a roadmap to what you're going to do on the property. How are you How are you going to service the property? Which way are you going to push the snow? Where are you going to put the snow? What are the hazards and the pitfalls on the property? Um, go into the uh, in-event detail. 
and uh, then we end with post event processes. And so let's just flip through some of this. I won't go into detail on all of this, uh, but so what do you need to train your folks on? Well, how about the clothes that they should be wearing out in inclement weather? You know, proper, prop, proper safety precautions, um, operating procedures specific to the job. Review of state laws pertaining to operating and transporting equipment and, and snow removal in general. You know, different states do have different laws. Uh, Michigan actually just changed a law that didn't allow you to have plows extended as you were driving down the street. That meant at three in the morning when nobody's out, if you drove from one property to the next and it was just across the street and you had your boss wings extended, you could get ticket, uh, t ticketed. So what are your state laws that are pertinent to your state? Um, safety uh, processes and procedures while performing the job, staking of properties, proper reporting procedures for your company. Um, see, what we did in the standard is in many cases, we didn't tell you specifically what to do because every company is different, or we didn't tell you how to do it. We just said you had to do these things. Okay, so why would we do all of this? Well, think about a deposition and they're going to come back and attorney, an attorney is going to be sitting there and going to say, well, have you been trained to do snow and ice management? A lot of people's answer is I've been doing it for 25 years. And the attorney's gonna come back and say, have you been trained on snow and ice management? They're gonna try and pin you in a corner on why you did a bad job and where, why their client got hurt. So what we say here is, here's the education and training, and then you document that training. It doesn't have to be some sophisticated sort of documentation, it can be simple that here are the people that are in this training seminar here are the, that we're putting on it can be a, a, a tailgate talk it can be sitting in your shop and you're going to sign in your five crew members that you're training on you know the proper you know installation of plows whatever it's going to be for that day it could be the proper reporting procedures write down who provided the training what time the you know the training went to and from and what the topic of the training was stick it in the file and hold on to that file that way when a deposition comes up you can pull out yeah here's my training file these guys were all trained okay so what you're trying to do here and what the in what the information the detail in a lot of this is what you need to do and then what the paper trail is going to be for this um so that you have it documented so you know you look at that's just the education and training side of it let's talk about in event documentation you know in event documentation is going to say what time did you get to the property? What were the conditions like on the property when you arrived? What crew members were arriving on the property and what equipment were they, they using? What'd you do on the property? What didn't you do? Maybe you didn't do the loading docks because they had some semis in there from a late night delivery and uh, you're gonna come back at 8 a.m. Well, you wanna document that. As you all know with the LMN software system, that's all built in. So one of the advantages to utilizing LMN is that it abides by or it conforms to, I guess is even be a better way to say it, the ANSI standards. It helps you gather the information that you need in your company to protect, your, protect yourself in the event that a lawsuit does come about a couple of years down the line. So um, from an education, and from an in-event documentation standpoint, this, it's all in there. We, we built all this stuff. We tell you exactly what needs to be in the pre-season site inspection. So um is it pertains to standards i'll just throw this out there how do you get the standards a, a, a <clears throat> excuse me asca members get the standards at no charge as soon as you join that's the first thing we send to you we send you a white binder it's got a whole bunch of stuff in there but the main document is the ANSI standards um folks have purchased them i will tell you we sell them for our highest membership cost which is 400 dollars um, the reason we do that, quite frankly, is because we know the only people that are going to buy the standards that aren't snow and ice management companies are going to be plaintiff's attorneys. So we might as well make some money off of them. Um, they either buy those, they, the attorneys generally buy them directly from ANSI. Um, we, uh, we sell them uh, here, but we don't sell very many copies. Um, so anyways, so now <clears throat> we, we looked at the first pillar here and the, you know, the first stage of risk management is having the proper processes and procedures in place to run a successful and uh, efficient and risk averse company and to document what you've done so that you know what went on when you get called to a deposition years down the line. So in dealing with the insurance world, the next step was, all right, great. So you're gonna have standards, you're gonna develop standards. We think that's good. That's a benefit to what we're doing here. How do we know the snow and ice management companies read them? 
That's where our education originally came from. Okay, I mean, to prove to the insurance world that you have read and been educated on the standards and risk management. So to get ASCA certified, all the courses are online. Um, and if you look at the first 10 courses, which are up on the screen, education and training to meet industry standards, contract language for the snow and ice management industry, ice management and snow management basics. Oh, why do I have to watch that? Let's go back to the question from the depositions. Have you ever been trained on snow and ice? There are 28 minute classes on the basics of snow and ice management. We watch, we have you watch those, take those so that you you can literally look at the plaintiff's attorney and say, yep, here's my certificate. You get a certificate every time you pass a class because uh, we want you to, we abide by the documentation paper trial as well. And so you go down the line there, uh, we've now got five levels of classes, but to get your initial certification, when you go to the website, just go to the 101 level classes and you can take classes that will, these are the classes, uh, talk about the contract language, uh, you know, basics of snow and ice, uh, documentation to meet industry standards, all of those things that are gonna help you as a company owner run a more efficient and risk averse business. Um, some interesting facts after people have gotten certified that there are comments that I have gotten is I had one one good gentleman tell me, hey, it was great. I got all my guys certified and now they listen because I didn't have to tell them. You know, he found that it was more beneficial for a third party to deliver the information to them and why they're doing these things and why they're following things. Now, I used to ask for, you know, the in event documentation all the time and they were like, oh, I'm too busy. I can't get all this done. When somebody comes in and explains to them, it's because we're trying to run a more risk averse business and protect the company and protect your jobs and protect everything. Uh, they tended to listen. That was just one scenario, but I thought that was an interesting interesting comment. So this, avail this is available all online on the ASCA website, which is ASCAonline.org. Uh, classes are $15 a class, $150 to take all 10 and to get your certification. So um, really started to satisfy insurance requirements. So when you're losing $500 million in a program as an industry, you generally just don't want to go, okay, great, they've been educated. That nah, sounds good to me. We'll start and churn them again. Um, they said, what, what they were saying to me was, hey, listen, we get that they're educated, but we're still not convinced. So how can we verify? How can we make sure that they've implemented these standards into their businesses and that they have the proper processes and procedures in place? So what we did is we went to ISO, um, the International um, Standards Organization. Um, so if you look at ISO 9001, which many of you are familiar with, and you say, oh man, that's a manufacturing deal. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, they changed the ISO standards 9001 a year ago or two years ago to actually be more service industry friendly. Um, what we did is we created SN 9001 and they accredited that as well. I, that was a process we had to do through ANSI. And what SN 9001 does, so let's go through this. ISO 9001, very simply, ensures that your company has the processes and procedures in place in order to ensure service quality. It means you can do the job that you've been contracted to do, that you have processes for training, that you have processes for going out, for dispatching, and that they're written down and your company knows it. A company comes in and actually does, they call it an audit, I think it's a terrible term and it's a bad marketing term, but they look at your processes and procedures and they make sure that you have these things uh, to get the job done. And all the SN 9001 side does is it goes through and makes sure that you have implemented the standards into your company. Okay, so what does that mean? It means they're gonna to wanna to take a peek at uh, your training documentation. Let's see, you know, how do you maintain uh, training records? They're gonna to wanna to look at your preseason inspection reports, make sure you're doing those. They wanna look at your in event documentation. But it's an independent third party now that puts a stamp of approval on your company that you have all these things in place in order to run a better company, okay? Um, auditors are certified by ANSI. Um, there are dozens across the country now. I need to update that slide. Uh, Case Snow Management was the first to be uh, certified, but dozens are, of other ones are now certified. I'm not gonna dive deeply right now into the ISO 9001, but it, it's a verification system that the insurance carriers and your customers can now look and say, hey, 
they are different. They can differentiate themselves from the other companies. We know that they can get the job done because an independent third party has audited their processes and procedures. We know that they've implemented the standards into their business. And from an insurance standpoint, we now know that they're a better risk to insure. And so now they can look at you and say, hey, this is awesome. The insurance world is looking at this and we're just going to insure people that are ASCA certified and ISO certified. So um, basically, there's three areas of your business that you have to write down what your processes are for your administrative, then your operation side of the business, and of course, the sales side of the business. And so I've got more education online on ISO certification. You can dive into that if you're interested. I don't want to spend a ton of this presentation on that part of it, um, but it's a, it's a simple process and procedure. Um, a little bit more complicated than simple, but you do have to do some things in your business to write these things down and ensure that you have the, the processes and procedures that an auditor can see. Um, when we looked at this and we looked at everything that we were doing at AFCA, we kept these three quest questions in mind. And this is what a plaintiff's attorney is gonna get and say when he gets a lawsuit. Can I win it? Can I win it quickly? And how much can I get? Okay, they're taking them all on retainer. So they wanna make sure they can win it. When you start looking at the stuff that we're putting in place or that we've put in place with the ISO certification, with the ASCA certified and the following of the standards, they're not going to be able to answer positively to all those questions. And they're going to start filing less claims, which is going to be a good thing for this industry. So um, let's go back to those industry averages because now we've had our certifications out there and what this means to your business. I've got on the left-hand side of the screen the numbers I went through before. And then I've got on the right-hand side of the screen what's happening to happening uh, within the AFCA insurance program. When you jump from 35% of lawsuits dismissed to or claims dismissed to 70%, you're doing something right. Okay, it's a huge, huge jump, and it's why the insurance companies are looking at us and looking to insure people that have these certifications that are following the standards. We're going from a two-to-one loss to a profitable insurance program, which is wonderful for the industry and wonderful for the insurance companies. Only 20% of those lawsuits have been settled, okay, which means there's 10% outstanding, which is always the case. There's always going to be some things outstanding. Um, none have gone to trial yet, but look at the average payouts too, and I didn't talk about that earlier. The average payout for a slip and fall lawsuit against a snow and ice management company is $15,132. In this program, because they know they can defend you, if they are settling, it's for almost four times less, $4,100. And that's pretty much to say, here, here's $4,100, and we're not going to go spend $50,000 trying to fight something that you not, know you're not going to win. So, um, so talking about the first three pillars here, the industry standards, education, and verification. Those are about the snow and ice management industry doing a better job of representing itself to the outside world. Gives you a better position with the insurance companies. It gives you a more marketable and selling position with the property owners and property uh, management companies. And finally, it gives us a leg to stand on as the ASCA dealing with legislative bodies. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the legislative side of things. Five years ago, I think it was, I was at a conference that I had gone to and I learned about a law at the federal level uh, called the Lawsuit Abuse Reduction Act, which I will talk about here momentarily. But I was talking with the, this older gentleman uh, and at this conference, uh, I had gotten introduced to him. He was the guy that I had supposedly had to, had to meet. And so as I'm talking to him, I'm explaining the issues in the snow and ice management industry. And he says, well, would you be willing to testify? in Congress. And I said, yeah, sure. And I didn't really think anything would become of it. Uh, so I get back to the office and I emailed the guy. Uh, ends up, I did some research on him and he is actually the guy that wrote the book on tort reform. And when I say he wrote the book, he wrote the college textbook that they use to teach tort reform in colleges. Um, so he sends an email. I, I sent him a thank you note, not expecting to hear back. Sends me an email uh about an hour later and all of a sudden he's starting to give instructions in this email and said brian can you do this and joe can you do this and call kevin and um it was really kind of comical so on the first call that i had um i looked up by the way at all the email addresses because i was like who is he talking about they all said us.gov 
he had copied the subcommittee on the Constitution in our U.S. House of Representatives. And so Paul Taylor calls me up and we're on the phone and I'm, hey, I got an audience with the government. I'm going to get this thing done. And I'm going into my speech and I'm, hey, there's 30,000 slip and fall lawsuits and here's this and here's then he goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You mean to tell me that they're suing people in the United States for slipping and falling on snow and ice? This is our government. And I sat there and I was like, yeah, we went through this conversation. I got off the phone and I'm thinking about this. I'm like, geez, oh man, that's not their fault that we got a problem. That's ours. We never told them. We never told them. How are they supposed to do something about something when nobody tells them what's going on? And so we kicked off the ASCA's legislative initiatives. Okay. <clears throat> Law keeps getting introduced. We're trying to get it introduced against this time. It has gotten through the House twice. Essentially, what has happened here, and for those of you that don't know the history, I didn't, so it's nobody's fault. Back in 1993, any of you that did snow and ice in the 80s don't remember slip and fall lawsuits because they didn't have them. Back in 1993, our Congress changed the federal rules of civil procedure. This is in the United States. Um, and essentially, they changed one word. It used to be that it was mandatory for judges in the federal courtroom to implement sanctions on plaintiffs and their attorneys that are found to have filed a frivolous lawsuit. What would the sanctions be? Could be a suspension. Likely, it would be that they had to pay the defense attorney's fees. They changed the word mandatory to discretionary, which means they weren't sanctioning their buddies because they're all lawyers, which means it opened up the floodgates for the frivolous lawsuits that we see today. Lawsuit Abuse Reduction Act, yes, we have been to Washington numerous times on behalf of that. That is in that meeting with a face-to-face -face meeting with Paul Taylor, and this is a group. We have also been to uh, up in Canada uh, to the par Parliament buildings. We're working up there to try and get this bill uh, moved along as well. Um, but uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is get it back to that mandatory so that judges have to impose sanctions for the frivolous lawsuits. We know there's a bunch of them that are out there. I could tell story upon story upon story. Guy in New Jersey, got a lawsuit sitting on his desk, and of course he was mad, read through it. Guy got out of the car, his wife got out of the car and walked around the car, he slipped and fell in a handicapped spot, and it's a Snow and Ice Management Company's fault, and that was at a Walmart. So a month or two later, same contractor sitting there, gets another lawsuit, reading through this one, guy gets out of his car, his wife got out of the car, walked around the car, slipped and fell in a handicap spot, but this was at a Lowe's. The first one was at a Walmart, the next one was at a Lowe's. He's like, wow, that sounds familiar. It was the same guy. Apparently he has a habit of just going around filing lawsuits. That one, I think they were able to get uh, dismissed, but there's, a, I could tell story upon story of frivolous lawsuits and things that are out there. I won't do that today because you guys have lived this, I'm sure. However, it only takes one to get things started. And let's talk about our state level initiatives because the state level initiatives, the Snow Removal Limited Liability or Liability Limitation Act is the ASCA's model legislation. Okay, that means that we've actually developed this legislation and are working independently to get this done. The Lawsuit Abuse Reduction Act is actually the NFIB's legislation that we support. So we've been working at the state level to get this bill passed. And what this bill would do is it would make the hold harmless and indemnification agreements in your contracts null and void when the property owner or property management company passes their liability onto the snow and ice management company. So that's a picture with me and uh, Mike Weiss and Senator Bruce Tarr. That's in Massachusetts. I last week testified in a joint committee in the House and the Senate on this bill. We are hopeful that this bill will get moved in Massachusetts and moved quickly now that we have it moving. Um, this is in Pennsylvania, and I just got off a call an hour ago with some folks in Pennsylvania that I'm working on getting the bill reintroduced in Pennsylvania. We had it in last term, weren't able to get it moving. Um, that's New Jersey. We do have uh, Assembly Bill 3968 and Senate Bill 665 in Jersey that we're working to get moving. 
Um, that's in Michigan, where we are working to get our bill reintroduced there towards the end of this year. Um, the good side of it is, in 2016, Illinois enacted our bill, unanimously passing the House and the Assembly there and signed by the governor in August of that year. In Colorado, August of 2018, our beta test on legislation was Illinois, so we were only doing one state at a time. Um, Colorado enacted it two years later in August, so that was before last season. And Friday, the governor of Connecticut signed our bill, so it is now law in Connecticut. So we've got it passed now in three states, working, like I said, in Massachusetts. Uh, in Massachusetts, it is Senate Bill number 1116, if you wanted to look it up. Uh, we have it introduced in uh, New York as Assembly Bill 4489, in New Jersey as Assembly Bill 3968 or Senate Bill 665. Um, we're close in Pennsylvania, Michigan, um, and a few other states uh, of getting it reintroduced or introduced and getting it moved along. Uh, I also had a call with the New York uh, House of Representatives or Assembly this morning, and we have a, a plan in the second half of this year uh, to get it moving in New York, uh, to do that in New York and Pennsylvania and Jersey. At some point here, when we get dates, I'm going to be calling out the ASCA members to come join us in your state capital so that we can meet with representatives on this bill. But uh, anyways, uh, when you look at this, uh, that's our folks in Wisconsin. I usually take a small group of people with us. You can get things done, especially at at the state level, uh, like I said, I, you know the folks at uh, Garden Grove, uh, David Lammers and I have been talking, you know, get, about getting it going in Canada. Um, and all you have to do is use your voice. Um, so none of this is possible though without all the other work that we have done. And the standards are the basis of everything. The education is based on the standards. The ISO certification is based on the standards. The voice in the industry is based on the standards and the ability to go to a legislature and say, hey, listen, we've done all that we can do. We've got an ANSI standard. We're doing everything that we can to represent ourselves well. We still need a little bit more help here. It makes us credible to lawmakers because we're just not in asking for a favor, okay? So the standards are gonna improve your processes and procedures in your business. They're gonna make you a more risk averse business um, and there's something that you can use in the sales and marketing side, um, and uh, it helps us with the legislative side of things. So um, I do have uh, um, you know, some membership information for those of you that are not members, uh, if you'd like to join ASCA. Uh, when you get to the promo code, if you type in LMN, you will get a 20% discount on your uh, membership. And so that's a little bit about uh, the ASCA and what we're doing to help you guys manage risk in your and gals uh, in your businesses. And uh, you know I'm readily available at kgilbride at g or at uh, ASCAonline.org uh, or my number's on there. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, Jennifer or Rachel, I'm not sure if we have questions at this point, but uh, I'm open for answering anything that anybody has asked. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the enlightening session. It's obviously clear from the work that you've done and the legislation that you've been championing that the future is looking brighter than it has in a while for the snow and ice industry. So thank you so much for sharing that, um, as well as those best practices. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, Rachel wants to know a little bit more about um, which organization um, and what the progress has been on legislation in Canada if you have any information on that. Yeah, so I am um, reaching out actually with Landscape Ontario and talking with the folks over there uh, to try and work together on that. We've had some initial meetings. Um, the Canadian government is no different. Well, I guess it is a little bit different um, than the United States and ways of getting things done are a little bit different uh, if the member brings it, um, you know, to... Uh, their, their version of committee rather than having a, you know, independently sponsored bill. So what we're in the initial stage of working through the best way to have the bills introduced into the, the Canadian system, but we are in the process of working on that and discussing it. Perfect. Thanks so much for that. Um, another question just came in from Jonathan. Um, he says, I work for a company that has handled large commercial contracts for over 30 years, mostly without any form of contract at all. 
how do I convince upper management to introduce mm -hmm. contracts? <laughs> That's a, it's a great question. Um, once I will <laughs> preface this by saying I am not an attorney, so I am not giving legal advice. Um, I know Josh Ferguson, who is our general counsel, would say that's a bad idea because now nobody has any idea who's liable for anything. And so if it does come down the pipeline and you're sitting there and a lawsuit comes up, there's no definition of anything that you're supposed to do on the property or not do on the property. And so a simple contract that just defines what you're responsible for um, is a more risk averse practice, I would say. Um, you know, if you're responsible for snow and ice, and I've seen this happen, um, and I know a guy that actually signed a bad contract, and this is when they signed it, um, but you're the snow contractor and somebody slipped and fell on snow and ice inside the store. Somebody dragged snow in the store. They got dragged into the lawsuit. So are you responsible for stuff inside the store? Are you responsible for sidewalks or, they, you know, so it's just a good business practice in today's day and age to have something that defines what you're responsible for on a property and what you're not responsible for. I know the old school way, you know, there's some old school folks that just won't change. Uh, but any lawyer will, that's worth his, you know, price and salt will tell you that, uh, you need you, you really need to be using a contract. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question from Polly, um, and she'd like to know: Does Ohio have some sort of law where slip and fall lawsuits are not so easily filed? Something possibly regarding naturally occurring conditions? Okay, most of the states are under the nat <clears throat> the natural accumulation law. Um, to be honest with you, and I'm in Ohio. Ohio is a more tort friendly state it's more conducive or easier to do business. So you're, while you're not protected, um, we're not as litigious here, but trust me, they happen. Um, so what the natural accumulation law reads is that natural accumulations of snow and ice, you are not responsible for. However, unnatural ones you are, which is really kind of a dumb law, and I'm pretty sure it was implemented before they built roads. Um, what that means is as soon as you drop the plow and you move it, it's unnatural. And so now you can take on the liability. Um, so you're better off not plowing. Well, that doesn't, that's not real conducive to businesses. Um, and so most states are under the natural accumulation, accum accumulation law. The only states that are not under the natural accumulation law are Connecticut uh, and Massachusetts. And both of those are under the reasonable care law which states that you have to take reasonable care of your property in a reasonable time frame, which I think is probably a little bit better maybe, um, unless they're utilizing hold harmless agreements as property owners to and indemnification clauses to skirt the legislative, to skirt the law. And that's what they're doing up there. Um, here they're doing it for the same reasons. But is Ohio less susceptible than New York to lawsuits? Yeah, uh, I think it, I, I think we just have less filed because it's, you know, just differences in society. Um, you will also find that, um, you know, the closer that you get to a major city, the probability of lawsuits is increased. Part of that's due to just more population and part of it's due to um, socioeconomic issues, so. Um, question from Brian. What is ASCA doing to promote certified contractors? Um, in terms of uh, some of the costs will be going up uh, as compared to the competition? Um, well, we have a section on our website, no, number one, to uh, highlight it. And the reason it's there, uh, in, anybody that's certified has their, their logos, uh, the certification logo next to their name for any property owner or manager to look up. Uh, so we maintain that database. Uh, the main reason it's there is for property owners and managers to be able to come in and look. Uh, we do provide materials, uh, including logos and so forth, for snow, for certified companies uh, to include in their marketing materials uh, that are out there. And I do a lot of talking and speaking. Uh, and one of our initiatives, I think that's a great question, is actually to get for me and the ASCA team to get more involved with the BOMAs of the world uh, and do more education and promoting at that level. Uh, something we need to do more of, to be honest with you. 
Uh, Jonathan had just a quick follow-up to the question that he asked about um, contracts. So if our company does not have contracts with customers, can individual employees be dragged into slip and fall lawsuits? I am not an attorney. Um, and I, I, I would defer that question to an attorney. Um, we're going to take one final question here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so you would like, would like to know if we're in a state where there's no activity, uh, who are the best people at the municipal and state level to reach out to, to get the ball rolling? Reach out to me and I'll help you. Um, <laughs> your representatives, um, seriously. Um, I think, you know, if you have people going rogue, um, without having the story, I've probably, I've been in hundreds of, my meetings now uh, promoting this bill and I'm you know so obviously I'm, I end up being the expert there um, we got derailed in one state when a bunch of folks you know tried to go their own way and, and try and help get this done and so it put us behind by a year and uh, I think I would say we've got minimal activity in a number of states but uh, it, I need to work with contractors in the state. Um, in Pennsylvania, Steph Sowers uh, is um, my, my lead person and she's been doing a wonderful job of initiating contact, keeping in touch with her congressman who is sponsoring our bill. Um, I, can, I, I jump on conference calls all the time. I told you I, I had two conference calls today on legislation from my office and it was me and it was a local contractor with their congress uh, person, um, congresswoman in one case and congressman in another. Um, Donnie Ch Chiapata in uh, Connecticut led the charge in uh, in Connecticut. We had a couple phone calls. I jumped on a plane, flew in there, met with a bunch of representatives, came home, flew. But once we got it uh, introduced, uh, I flew back up there and testified uh, along with four or five contractors, and uh, and we got it done. So um, I'm happy to happy to help. Wonderful. Or lead. I'm sure you'll be getting a few people reaching out to you. <laughs> Kevin, that's, um, good. that's great. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer questions. Um, I would like to point out that anyone who did register for today's session um, will be receiving an email with a link to the recording. So if there's anyone you'd like to share that with, um, within about 24 hours, um, you should receive a link to, to today's recording and we encourage you to share that. I know that uh, this topic is uh, a very important one in the industry. So uh, thank you again, Kevin. Um, for joining us today on the LMN Speaker Series. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye now.